Good morning. If you want to, I want to encourage you to take your Bible out and open them up to the book of Ephesians and leave them there because we're going to spend the majority of our time this morning considering the, the letter that Paul has written to the church in Ephesus. And for those of you that are, that are members here, we have been talking about this letter for, for some time now. Those of you who are visiting with us, I uh, want to talk just for a little bit about how we've got to this point where Paul has challenged the, the readers to walk worthy of the calling for which you have been called. So the beginning of the letter to the Ephesians starts off with a reminder for the, the Christians there in Ephesus to know, one, who they are, know your identity, to know what God has done. And he uses words like chosen, predestined, adopted, alive, saved, heirs. He uses these words to stress to them, know who you are, know what God has made you to be, but also the second part of that, know it was God that has done that. It is not by your merit, it is not by your power, it is not by your holiness or righteousness or wisdom, but rather by the grace of God, Ephesians 2.8. By the grace of God that this can be true about us, that we can be the chosen, we can be those uh, we can belong to this group of people where God has said, these are people that belong to me. We can be heirs and, and adopted into his family. We can be a part of the relationship of a family that belongs to God. And so he has been stressing that in the first three chapters. But then in the latter three chapters, chapters four through six, he's going to say how, the, how that should manifest itself in, in our lives. What should that look like? in the life of someone who has, been, who has been treated in such a way by God, what should that cause to grow out and be born in our lives? And we saw last time we looked at this, what Brother Luke read for us, Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, that to walk worthy of the calling required a certain attitude. And, and we describe that as unity. He said we are, we are going to be striving for unity. And the attitude that we might put on that is this, this idea of a, love, a loving deference for one another. That I put you above myself and with, and with humility and with patience, I am striving to maintain a relationship of peace between us. And I think in, in much of the world of Christianity, and I'm going to use that in a very broad sense right now, in the world of Christianity, that is something that, that, that is desired. We need to find a way to find unity. And we should do that by just having this loving attitude towards all who, who wear the name of Christ. About four to five years ago, a friend of mine was invited to a lectureship uh, with leaders from among his community from various uh, religious organizations. There were some there that were denominational. There were some there that would call themselves non-denominational. But they took the leaders of, from these churches and brought them all together to talk about a, a variety of topics, one of which was this idea of unity within Christianity. And in that conversation that were going on, it, it, one of the men pulled him aside and said, you know, just kind of based on some of the things you're saying, I, I take it you're a part of that Church of Christ cult. And if you've ever been called that, or if you've ever had people refer to the Church of Christ as a cult, no, understand this, to, to be able to make that claim, a lot of definitions have to be uh, re-examined and rearranged. We're going to rewrite what words mean to, 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 to bring that charge out. But his response to it was, well, I am a member of the Church of Christ. I'm not sure why you think of us as a cult, but I, I'm, just, I'm here for the same reason that you are. I want to try and discover how we can be unified. I think there is a way, and I, 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 want, to, I want that to, to grow out. And they went on to explain how they see unity, and it comes from, you can look this up, and much of what I'm about to say is not me putting words in somebody's mouth. Uh, there's a, an article written by Albert Moeller who uh, uses this phrase, the triage of faith. And if you've ever experienced anything related to triage, you might understand that. 
There are things that are more critical than others. You might have a terrible a scene where there are many people that are injured and we'll say, okay, we're going to have to triage this. So there's some that are more life-threatening. We'll deal with them first. And there's others that we, we need to get to, but these guys have to take priority. And then there's some that we may not ever get to. They're, they're, they're hurt maybe, but you know what? They'll, they'll probably be all right with some Advil and, and a bandage and we'll send them on their way. So we're not going to concern ourselves with them. Well, that's sort of the concept behind the way that they were trying to create this unity. They were talking about orders of things. And of first importance, uh, things that we would, we would all, I think, likely agree are, are extremely important. They would say these things are necessary for us to agree that, that everybody involved is Christian. We must agree on these things. One is the existence of God. We, we can't be Christians without that. Right up there with it would be then monotheism. We must believe that God is and that He is alone God. There's no other religions that have gods that are going to be deity like God is deity. We must also agree in the full deity and humanity of Christ, that Christ is, uh, is both 100% God and also 100% man who came to earth and died for us. That also would include that idea of the Gospels. The Gospels must be believed as valid and authoritative in our lives. And then this idea of justification by faith, uh, that, that concept may be understood differently by different people who say it, but the concept that we're not going to heaven because we're really, really good people. We're going to heaven because we trust in God to, to, to be faithful to, his, to, to what he has said he will do. But in some way, we trust in God, not in ourselves. These are of first order. If we can all agree on this, we can, well, then we can all agree we're Christians. But then there's a second order of things, and these are things which may break our fellowship, but they, they wouldn't, uh, we would still be underneath that first order necessity uh, that we're all still Christians. And that's going to be things such as baptism. What are the means by which, what's the purpose of it, but also the mode in which it is administered. You know, some churches sprinkle, some churches pour, other churches immerse. Uh, we can have disagreements on those things that might be so sharp that we can't worship together. Can't worship with you because your understanding of baptism is not the same as mine, but we all still recognize we're Christians because we agree on that first set of things. Hopefully in your mind, you're kind of picturing a target. And the center is where all these first set of things are, and then we have expanding rings that go out. Uh, the, the role of women in the church. There's some churches that are okay with women serving as pastors and ministers and other churches that aren't okay with that. And those might break our fellowship. We can't worship together. But hey, we're all still Christians. Um, virgin birth and Trinity is on this list. Kind of was a, sh a shock to me in this. Though. You don't have to believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. You don't even have to believe in the concept of the Trinity. We, we all understand that that is going to be hard for some people, but we can all still agree we're Christian because of the first order of things. And then lastly, you have this third order. These are things that are going to fall within local congregations, and they'll say, you know, these don't break fellowship. We can still worship together. Uh, but we, don't all, we may not always agree on these. Things like eschatology, what's going to happen in the end, what's going to happen when Christ returns. Uh, difficult passages, such as Mark 16, 17, and 18, which seems to talk a lot about handling snakes. And so there's some churches that say, hey, we need to be handling snakes. And yet, you know, we can, we can all worship together still, not agreeing on how that should be conveyed, or idea of instrumental music, fellowship halls, and institutions. Uh, this is, again, not putting words in anybody's mouth. This is this idea that they've put forward uh, that we have this spiritual triage, and this is the way that we are going to maintain unity by constructing this umbrella. And there's all of Christianity on the, under the umbrella, and we're all uh, we're all under it, so we all believe in these first order of things, but some of us are more in the center and others are more kind of on the, the outside edge, but there we are. And, and the way this is put into practice is like this. And this is, again, straight from Moeller's uh, article. Uh, the idea is, for example, Baptists and Presbyterians can have unity. They both agree on the first order of Christian beliefs. They agree on some of the second order, but except when it comes to baptism, they are not in agreement. Presbyterians support infant baptism to show that the child that is being baptized is a part of a covenant relationship that its family shares with God, and so it is baptized into that covenant relationship to share in that with its family, while Baptists insist that baptism is only for believers who are of the age in which they can trust in Christ for salvation. 
neither believing baptism is necessary for salvation uh, and not able to have fellowship with one another because of this disagreement on a secondary issue, and yet we are unified in Christ because we believe we're both Christians accepting the first order of beliefs. If that sounds a little bit bizarre to you, uh, and, and I hope it does, I hope that does sound a little bit bizarre, it's a lot of, of jumping through hoops to try to make this make this all fit. And the reason that we're doing this is because the question has been posed, rightfully so, and continues to be posed even in light of this triage. Jesus prayed for unity in John 17. Why are there so many different denominations? Why are there so many different churches that do not believe the same thing, cannot seem to to worship together, and, and yet everything is just okay and we're all going to the same place? Well, this is our answer. This is how we this is how we solve that conundrum. This is the concept that many in the religious world will use to answer that. And this is a concept that I think you will find when you have conversations with others becomes more and more prevalent as years go on. Uh, But in Ephesians chapter 4, we learn that unity at any cost is simply not what Paul has in mind here. We can try to come up with all this and find this unity because unity is the most important thing that, that we have in, 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 in our relationship with one another and with God. And Paul, I think, is going to say here that unity must exist and it can exist without loving concern for one another, but it has to be built on the proper foundation. What I hope we see through the course of this lesson this morning is that building a structure, a man-made structure in which we can all fit in, this is, this is what this is, it's a, a structure of the strongholds of our mind, that's not what God had desired. Instead, God built a structure, a foundation of truth in which He invites all of, of those who believe and follow after His Son to stand on together. And so Paul is going to introduce in this concept of unity He's going to introduce seven absolute truths and to help us construct our, or help us to see the construction that God has created to unite those who follow Him. We're going to spend a little bit of time reflecting on these and seeing how unity is built upon them. So, this the series of seven ones or seven truths, it starts in verse four. It says, There is one body. And one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. I just want to break these down very quickly, and we'll, we'll talk about them, and then the lesson will be yours. So number one, he says there is one body. And what we see in this concept of one body is the idea of unity that is found in, in our leadership Unity that is found in our function and care with one another. And so if there's one body, we understand there is one head that is guiding that one body. Uh, Paul alludes to this back in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22. He says that Christ is the head of this body. And so right off the bat, we understand that there are, there are those that might claim to be Christian and they may claim to desire to be unified with all. But if they have not subjected themselves to falling in line and being guided by the head, which is Christ, then not all churches are created equal. Not every, not every church that claims to be a part of the body, if it's not being directed by the head, then it's not a part of the body. That also means that if we are going to be a part of the body, that we just can't do whatever we want to do. We can't say that, well, you know, we're going to do this because the elders here want to do this. And the elders themselves can't say, we're going to do this because we want to do this. Instead, we are making ourselves in line with the head because we're a part of the body. We're part of that structure which is following after the direction that Jesus Christ provides as head of the body. But that also is going to entail that we're unified in the way that we think about one another and the care that we provide for that body. We don't come together, and, and, and Paul also uses this illustration of the body thinking parts are greater than the others and parts are not necessary. We don't come together and treat one another as, well, this part over here, this is the, the super good part of the body, and these parts over here, they're not as good, and so we just gonna, we just be happy to cut them off or, or just ignore them and act like they don't exist. Instead, we are to have a care in which the body is working together, each part of it whether it be a a part that is greatly strong and powerful or a part that seems insignificant. 
All of it is working together. All of it has a purpose in which everything provides and it causes growth of the body again around what? Around the head. Growing up in the direction that the head is providing. But I would also say that while we might see that in a local church, that also implies that other local churches that might be a part of that body deserve that same sort of care and consideration. You know, down the road, we have the Lakeside Church of Christ. And across town, we have the Somerset Church of Christ. And we could go up to, to Eubank, and we could go down to Monticello, and we could see all around us our, our congregations, people that have, that have banded together with the, the headship of Christ in mind to say we want to follow where the head is leading us. And they are likewise parts of the body. And we are not to be in competition with them. If there was a group here that, that came together and, and they decided we're... We're going to, to try to do everything better and even at the detriment of other parts of the body here within Southside. The elders might have a cause to, to pull them aside and say, what are you doing? If you break them down, if you try to do everything the, the way that you like it or you try to do things to, to magnify your thoughts and you break down another part of the body, you're hurting us all. We need them to be strong and you to be strong and all of us to grow together. And the same thing is true likewise of the congregations around us, around us who have similarly submitted themselves under the headship of Christ. We need to pray for them. We need to encourage them. When they have gospel meetings, we need to go and try to support them. When, when they have opportunity that, or we have opportunity to join in with them even outside of, of corporate worship, we need to be of the mindset that this is the body of Christ just like I am and I have a desire to see them grow just like I have a desire for the church here at Southside to grow as well. Because we are one body. And we are united in that. When that is also something that is constructed by this concept of there being one spirit. There, is a, uh, there was a video that was going around not too long ago. Uh, there, uh, a church, I can't remember the name of it, so I'm not even going to try to say who it was. But they were having a, a baptismal Sunday. And so all, they, all these people who have said they wanted to be baptized, they've all come together to be baptized on this Sunday, and it was kind of opened up to the, to the congregation as well. If you're thinking about this, this is the day we're doing it, so it would be a good time to do it. And this girl came up, a young lady, she came up, and, and when she was brought before on, onto the stage, and they're about to baptize her, and they said, well, tell us why you're being baptized today. And she said, the Spirit of the Lord has put it on my heart to be a warrior for the animals. And I am going to go into the world and I am going to, to, to fight for their rights. And I am going to free them from their captivity. Because the Holy Spirit has put that on my heart. And I must be baptized to do that. And the, the, the man with the microphone, whatever he was, he just looked at the congregation and said, praise God for the Spirit's guidance in her life. When we look at the Holy Spirit, there are so many misconceptions of what the Spirit is doing today and what it has done in the past. But when we open up the Word of God, we see a few things that stand out and are very stark and very clear. The Holy Spirit has been involved in the, the, the life of mankind repeatedly throughout Scripture, but in the ways in which He revol is involved, they repeat again and again. He is involved, and again, I say he and not it. The Holy Spirit is an entity uh, unto himself and unified with God, the Father and God the Son. But he is involved in guiding people to where God is. And you go back to the, the children of Israel as they march through the wilderness. The Holy Spirit in the form of a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire goes before them, leading the way to, to which they are going to be unified with God in Canaan. That was part of His job, was to guide them, to lead them from where they were to where God is. But not only that, the Holy Spirit's job was to reveal the presence of God as well. So you might remember that they constructed the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is filled with God's presence. The temple, likewise, in Solomon's day is constructed and filled with God's presence. 
But when you're a, a Jew and you wake up in the wilderness and all of our, all of our establishments, our, our tents, our homes that we've made as we sojourn through the wilderness are built in such a way that they all surround the tabernacle and we face towards the tabernacle. So you get up and you stretch in the morning and get about to go about your day. And the first thing you see is the pillar of cloud that rests above the tabernacle, indicating God's presence is still here. And there was no concept, no subjectivity, no opinion where the Israelites went out and said, hey, I think we should go to that mountain up there. That's where we need to move today. They came out and said, God's still in the tabernacle. We're camping here. Or they came out and the presence of God had moved up to, to the mountain over the hill and they said, it's time to pack up and go because that's where God's presence is and that's where we want to be. But there was nothing subjective about it. There was no, I think this is what God is trying to tell us. It was clear and it could be understood. What does it sound like? Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse starting by 3, uh, starting in verse 3 says that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. We still likewise today need to understand there is one Spirit. And that one Spirit is there to guide us in the ways uh, that are going to lead us to the Father. And he is to reveal the presence of God in our lives. And thus Galatians, Paul writes to the Galatians and says, it is the fruit of the Spirit that God is dwelling within you. The Spirit, just think of a pillar of cloud emanating from your head, is the fruit of the Spirit. These things indicate that, that God dwells uh, amongst us. But all of this is singular in that there is only one and it's not going to be subjective. It's not going to be different from person to person. And the way that we can understand this absolute, Paul says, is by reading that which the Spirit has revealed through His Word in the apostles and to the, and to the prophets. We need to understand that there is one Spirit that is unifying us in the direction and in the performance of our life that indicates God dwells amongst us. And that one Spirit leads us into our next absolute, and that is the one hope. And there are, there are many things that, we might be, that might be housed inside of this concept of hope. We have hope of renewed blessings in God. We have hope of, of restored hearts. We have hope of a restored kingdom and a covenant of forgiveness. All of these might be involved inside that. But what we need to understand is the hope that God gives to one, God gives to all. And what this does is it unifies us in the object and the, the, the heart of our worship. We don't come here today and, and praise God as people who have different hopes. It's not like God came and said, you know, Kyle, you have a hope of a new family with me in heaven. But some of you all, you have the hope of just kind of being observers of that family. You get to know that it's out there. You get to see it from the, from the periphery. Uh, some of you have a hope of, of, of residing with the Lord in eternity, and some of you have the hope of just getting to clean the streets after it's over. You can be a servant in the kingdom, but you're not going to be a part of the family of God. That's not what God describes. But I want you to ask you, what sort of worship would we offer up had we had these different sorts of hopes? Might the praise of some be greater than the praise of others? And the desire for that confident expectation to be made real be more fervent in some than rather than others. Instead, God did not say, I have, I have given some a hope of this and some a hope of that, but rather one hope. That through the working of the Spirit that is guiding us to where God is, we all can share in this confident expectation that God is saving us, that God is renewing us, that God is, is bringing us into His family, and that God is securing a place where eternally we will be His, free from harm, free from the effects of sin, forever in the light of His holiness and purity. And what's that hope centered around? It's centered around our one Lord. Jesus is King. 
And there's unity found in this truth that, that there is only one, there's a, this is a monarch, a monarchy that we belong to. There are many in the world today, starting from here, we're going to start seeing things that maybe we don't agree on as much in the religious world. We may agree on these first things and to, to various levels, but we're starting to see things that are going to be under attack by the world, and this being one of them. Jesus is king. There are many in the world, and I'm going to say there are also many in the church, many in, within the body of Christ <clears throat> who live as if they don't respect this truth that Paul has just said. There is one Lord. In other words, there is one King. In a desire to preserve unity at any cost, by ignoring differences, by ignoring uh, things that stand opposed to the rule and the sovereignty of Jesus, you might look and say, hey, you know what? I, I don't think that's right. In fact, I think the Bible is pretty clear that goes against God's, God's will, that goes against the desires of... <coughs> excuse me. Desires of the Lord. Um, but, but if I was to stand against that, you know, we, our, our numbers may be smaller. We may not uh, be able to bring as many people in. Whatever the reason that we might put up against that, say we, we cannot stand for, for submission to the Lord, and so we are going to ignore it, and we are going to pretend that we have unity with one another. That's one way that we could respond to that. There's another way we could respond to that, and that is to say, you know, listen, I know we don't agree on these things. I know that we have differences. I look right here in the Bible. It's the Word of God telling us what He desires. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bow a knee to Jesus, and I'm going to stand with Him, and my desire is for you to stand with me. If you don't want to do that, we can't have unity. It's not because I don't like you. It's not because I don't think you're important. In fact, I would, I would desire anything. Paul said, I would, I would wish that I could give my, my life, that I could take their place to make Israel united with God. Desire anything for that. But I cannot, I cannot lose the fact that Christ is King. And so no matter what my desire may be, if we are going to be united, we stand together. We must live as if there is only one Lord. And we say, okay, you think of a Venn diagram. Here's the things that I want to do. And here's the things that, that Christ says to do. And in the places where they overlap, that's where I'm going to reside. I'll do everything that I want to do that Christ wants to do. In effect, what you're saying is, you know what, there are two kings in my life. There's Christ and there's me. Paul repeatedly is going to use this illustration. But here in Ephesians chapter 2, he says, there is only one Lord. In the concept of unity, we must submit ourselves to Christ. And there is only one faith. Again, something that is grossly under attack. If you are to, to go and preach that there is only one correct way to believe about God. There is only one correct way in which to follow after God. God has given us only one revealed Word that we must become conformed to. You may be met with charges of arrogancy. Uh, if you were to preach and say that there's only one faith that is going to reach God, you might be, well, well what are you saying about all these other religions and all these, these other ways of thinking? You're being intolerant. You're being a bigot. And there's a problem in our society today, a problem that is housed within the way we understand truth. This is something that's being heavily eroded in our society. Uh, Writer has moved far beyond this uh, into to pre algebra, so my level of, of assisting him went out the door two grades ago. But I, I know enough to say one plus one still equals two, three plus three equals six. I can even do four times four, 16. But the concept of, of things that are absolute are being eroded, in which you say, well, one plus one doesn't always have to equal two. Well, how on earth do we prove that? Well, we change definitions. We change meanings. I have three water bottles up here, and Michael Ray comes and drinks one. I think that's a reality. It might happen. <laughs> I say, how many water bottles do I have left? 
Somebody might say, well, you know, it depends. It depends on well, how much water was in the water bottle. Is it really, uh, are they all full? And, and really, what is yours anyway? I mean, you claim you have three, but are they all three really yours? How do we, that's a very abstract way to define something. And, and we can make then that answer be whatever we want to be. And again, you might go, that's bizarre. The answer's two. But within the concept of our world and the way we see truth as subjective, it is equally bizarre for them to say, you mean there's only one faith that's going to be pleasing to God? No, you're being arrogant, you're being intolerant, and, and you are blatantly, blatantly ignoring uh, the, the fact that there are countless other ways in which people believe that they can make it to some form of heaven, even if we don't agree that, that heaven is where we're going. We have other thoughts. We'll get to that in just a moment. I want you to understand something, especially our, our younger people. You'll hear this charge, especially depending on where you go to college, you go into the workforce, you'll be met with people who don't believe and haven't been taught to believe the way that you have, and they will think this is extremely arrogant. This thought that there's only one faith. Truth. Truth is humble. I want to speak about that in a sense of personification of truth. Well, we could just take truth, this concept of, of, of an absolute truth, and turn it into a person and stand it here before you today. What are some characteristics that we'd find of them? One of those characteristics is truth is humble. I just say truth doesn't have to be boasted and puffed up for it to, to have value. Truth can be buried in the ground and covered in dirt, and whenever it surfaces again, it's going to be the same thing. Whether it's, it's parked on top of a high rise with all the lights in the world shining on it, or whether it's in the depth of the ocean, truth remains truth. A doctor, I don't know of, of very many people who would become angry and, and accuse a doctor of arrogancy and being intolerant uh, because they have told them uh, that this concoction that you made at home of, of gasoline and arsenic and, and all sorts of other goodies that we might find and put all this together and it's bubbling and green with smoke coming out of it. If you drink that, it is not going to cure the warts that you have, but rather it's going to kill you. Very few people, I think, that are going to look at that doctor and say, you arrogant, intolerant bigot, I will do what I want. They will recognize there's truth. They're of sound mind, they will recognize there's truth in this doctor's statement. There's care for them. Because truth doesn't care. Truth is not a respecter of persons. Truth doesn't care if you came from this socioeconomic background or, or if you were come from uh, money or you come from wealth or came from poverty. It doesn't care what your education is. Truth just remains true. It's the same thing to every person that it encounters. There are things in our life that are absolute. And when you stand for one faith, as Paul proclaimed here, that there is an absolute belief about God and, and His Word that must be re respected and must be adhered to. And you do that with love. right? We do that with gentleness and grace in our speech. Patience. Treat others as we would want to be treated. But when we stand for faith, there is one faith. We are not standing in arrogance, but in humility. And throughout history, people who have stood for that were not put on plaques, and their, their faces were not carved into mountains. They dressed in poverty, and they lived in poverty, and they died by worldly standards and shame. But they taught that message over and over again because truth doesn't change. There is one faith. Going on from this, Paul says there is one baptism. And we can't dance around this for the sake of unity. Just like truth is truth, baptism is baptism. When we look at it in the concept of 
the, uh, of the Bible. Baptism is how we ask God to cleanse our conscience. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Baptism is an appeal to God that He would wash our consciences clean. Baptism is where we take off garments that are stained uh, w- w- with sin. We talked about this concept in, in our, our lesson on modesty last week about this concept of trying to clothe ourselves. Baptism is we take the garments that we've tried to cover up our sin and our wickedness with that, that really do nothing but to reveal we are still naked and we are still in shame. Baptism is the place in which God says, I will put on the pure robes of Christ in your life. I will take your, your soiled and filthy garments and I will give you garments of my son and his purity. Baptism, according to Acts 2, verse 38, is where forgiveness for sins is found when accompanied with repentance. And baptism, according to Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, baptism is a work, not likened to the work of man where flesh is being removed from the body, but where sin is being cut from our lives. And when likened unto circumcision in Colossians 2, we see that baptism is then also a sign that God has given us that you belong to a covenant relationship with me. The Israelites were to go into the land of Canaan with, uh, un, under the, the guidance of Joshua after the generations that had died in the wilderness. God stops them and says, you can't go in there yet until you've circumcised the men. Because they had fallen out of that practice. We're in a covenant relationship with God, but yet we don't bear the sign of that. He says, you need to rectify this. In the same way, baptism today is a revelation to to each and every one of us. Personally, I know that I am in a covenant relationship with God because my sins have been cut from my soul. My sins have been cut from my heart in baptism. Now you go and you preach that. Or you preach that there is a mode of baptism that is revealed in Scripture. That, that the Greek word for baptism is uh, the, the Greek word baptizo. And it literally means to immerse, but it's used in the concept of dipping bread down into a bowl or burying a body underground. The idea is, is the idea of covering something, which is why it is used in contexts like Galatians 3.27 to cover us with Christ. So when you, you go and you teach that, or you teach the Bible reveals that, Acts, Acts 8, verse 38, Philip and the eunuch both went down into the water. Uh, something that wouldn't be necessary if we're just going to sprinkle or pour water over somebody. You teach that, and likewise, as with teaching there's only one faith, we're going to find that there is protest. And there are charges of, of arrogance. You say that baptism is necessary. And for just a second... The fact that baptism, Paul says, all right, I'm going to create this list. We're talking about unity. We're talking about having a unified mind and our care for one another. But we're also going to say that that doesn't just extend to everything. There's a foundation in which it's built on. And included in that is that there is, there, there, we're going to have to be united in hope. We're going to have to be united in the one spirit. We can't believe in a bunch of different spirits that are guiding us. We're going to have to be united in, in faith and that faith looks a certain way and faith is what it is. He's one Lord. We're going to be united. Which one of these are we look at and say, but that's not necessary. You don't have to believe Jesus is Lord. You can still be united with us and we can all go to heaven together. You say, that's preposterous. And yet, we'll look at baptism and say, well, that's not really necessary. Paul, including it in this list, says at, at the very least, it's on supreme importance as with the other things that are in this list, of which we'll get to in a moment, is God. So seeing the importance and the necessity of baptism from this and preaching that is going to be met with language such as, hey, you're putting an emphasis on what you do. This is all about the work of men. And where you know that salvation is by faith, it is, the, it is the work of God. Let me say right now, we're not emphasizing what we do in baptism. Colossians chapter 2 stresses that. Baptism is not likened to the work of men where flesh is being removed from the body. But it is a submission to God to allow Him to remove sin from our lives. In fact, let me, let me just to a, a thought to consider with our friends that proclaim we are saved by grace and grace alone. It is not of our, our salvation. We didn't merit it in any way. How do we receive that grace? 
How do I, as a sinner, go before God and say, God, I, I can't be saved by my deeds. I need your grace. I need to make an appeal to you. 1 Peter 3, verse 21 said, Baptism is an appeal to God that He would cleanse us because there's nothing I can do that can cleanse myself. How do I, as, how do I receive God's grace to have my sins forgiven? Peter, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, said, Be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Not because if you do a really good job being baptized, if you do a really good job letting somebody throw you underwater, then God will say, Hey, he's worthy. Because this is how God said, I will do it. Acts, I'm not Acts, Mark 16, verse 16. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. God is saying, through his spokesman Jesus, who is God, this is how I'm offering the grace to you. God, I want to wear your clothes because I recognize my filth. How do I receive the grace of this divine wardrobe? Galatians 3, verse 27. For all of you who have been baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. Over and over again, I want to say that we are not putting an emphasis on what we have done. We're putting an emphasis on what God has said and what God has revealed. He said, be baptized. We need to remove our pride. We need to remove our fear of what the world may think or how the world may judge. And we need to submit ourselves to following after what God has said. Why? Why does it matter? Paul ends with this. Because there is only one God. And he takes it a step farther. There's only one God and one and Father who is over all and through all and in all. One, right on the surface of that, and I think this is surface level, in judgment, the gods of other religions are going to do nothing for you. There is no concept for the Christian in which we will just be absorbed into some mysterious, powerful light. Uh, there is no idea of, of us praying to various gods, whether it be Allah or Brahma or Buddha. He's, he's not a god, but in judgment, there is one God who we will answer to. And none of these other various things will be able to stand and mediate on our behalf to say, this one belongs to me. He follows me. He's a member of my kingdom. Paul says there's only one God. And he says he is the Father. He started this conversation back in chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 5. He predestined us to adoption as sons of Jesus Christ to Himself. He says, there is only one Father. I think of that, and I can't help but think of my own father, who, this is the Hebrew author, wrote, has in many ways fallen short, but is a reflection of what the true and good Father is. And when I think about that, I think of Latchkey. Some of you kids are probably have no idea what that is. But I was a latchkey kid coming up in, in uh, elementary school. And what that implied was school let out, 3.30. Both my parents worked. They worked till 5, 6 o'clock. And so there was a program for kids like me. We could go into the gymnasium or wherever they were holding it that day, and, and we would hang out there under some, under some guidance until one of our parents came to pick us up. And that was the latchkey program. I was a latchkey kid. So... One of my friends that was in the latchkey program with me, Alex, I had so much fun with Alex because he was mischievous, and uh, we would do things that were, were risky, sometimes physically, always morally, and, and it was fun until Alex decided, you know what, I think I'm going to get my fun from you today. And he was fantastic at that. He had this great ability of finding something that bothered you, finding something that you were insecure about, finding some way to get, get popularity or to get humor at your expense. Sometimes mentally, a lot of times physically. Uh, and so one day, he, Alex had set his sights on me, 
Uh, maybe all the other kids that he liked to get his fun from had already went home, and so I was what was left. Alex starts picking on me. Push literally came to shove, and uh, I, was, I was hurt, and we were sitting in separate sides of the gymnasium. And I remember thinking, I remember thinking, just wait till my dad gets here. You just wait. I didn't think about how much trouble I was going to be in when dad got there, and I was. Uh, the dad came to pick me up, and uh, he, he came over, and he gave me a talking to. But this image will maybe never leave my mind of dad walking across the gymnasium, and I was like, somebody's about to die. Uh, and he is standing over Alex, and one hand's on his hip, and the other finger is just, and I don't know what he's saying, I don't know what he's doing, but I know that Alex didn't pick on me quite the same way after that. Because he's my father. <clears throat> And I'm his son. I'm his child. That's what fathers do. They care for their children. When somebody is mistreating them or somebody is, is, is abusing them, somebody is, is not giving them what the father deems is worthy, the father takes it upon themselves to say, I'm going to step in in some way. Paul ends this list for unity calling our attention to God as our Father. I think there's a concept in that where we go and vindication belongs to the Lord. It's not my place to strike back. But I think the other aspect of that is what he says next. He's over all, and he's through all, and he's in all. We have unity with one another because we know God is the Father. We know each one of these souls was created, was sired by him. They belong to him And they are, because of that, deserving of the right sort of treatment and care. And God, God is going to be unto His name. Paul's point in all of this, again, constructed around this concept of unity. Christians, remember who you are. Christians, walk worthy of your calling. Verses 1 through 3, that affects your attitude. We're going to have a a loving uh, and and caring dispensation towards those, uh, towards everyone, but especially towards those that are are of the same calling. But also, verses 4 through 6, Christians have your beliefs molded by this calling. There are absolute truths, and unity at the sake of those truths is not unity, it's make believe. These seven truthful statements are the foundation of our unity, but they're also the foundation of our salvation. The Bible is revealing to us that there is a body in which we can be belonging to, a body which is guided by the working of the Spirit, in which He is revealing the way of hope, the way that that we know is leading to life and forgiveness and eternity with God. And all of that is housed and encapsulated in the concept of Jesus Christ as the the dead and yet risen Lord. And it is faith in His working, submission to His plan of baptism, all of that which is powered by the grace and the mercy of God who raised Him from the dead that leads us to a place where we have life as adopted heirs, sons of God. If we can help you with that this morning in taking the the steps, the first steps of of coming to Jesus and following after Him. What we're asking you to do is step on this platform of unity with us that God has constructed in which we will stand together despite what the world may bring to try to divide us because we know who God is. We know He is our Father. If we can assist you with that in any way, come forward and let's talk about it together as we stand and sing.